Today's episode is brought to you by Bit.com. You'll be hearing more about them later on in today's interview, which begins right now. I am joined by Larry McDonald, New York Times bestselling author and founder of the Bear Traps Report. Larry, great to have you on Forward Guidance. The last time we spoke was the last summer, summer of 2021, and it is amazing how much things have changed. Can you just walk viewers through how you've been uh, experiencing, let's say, the past seven months? Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about inflation, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve, and the you know remarkable volatility we've seen in all sorts of risk assets. Well, thanks, Jack. Thanks for having us on. Um, we run behind us. We, we run a Bloomberg chat with about 650 institutional investors in 20 plus countries, and so we, we basically work with the institutions around the world. We kind of measure where they are in terms of, you know, where's the buy side really thinking? What's the, what are they thinking now versus six, nine months ago? And it's clear, you know, if you forget about the sell side, you know, sell sides are the banks and they're trying to sell something. They haven't, they're always axed. They're always have kind of a bias. Um, we focus on what the buy side is looking at. So that's your real asset managers, your pension funds, your hedge funds, your mutual funds. And so the buy-in toward sustainable inflation over the last year has dramatically increased. So in other words, everybody knows inflation is going to normalize. But if it normalizes at 4 to 6% and stays there for three years, that's where the trade is. And, and slowly but surely over the last year, there's more and more buy-side investors reallocating the portfolio for that kind of new world. Larry, I'm just going to read something from uh, the, the Bear Traps report. Uh, the quote, the Fed is promising a trillion dollars of quantitative tightening over the next 12 months. Who are they kidding? And I should say we're recording this on Tuesday, May 31st. And tomorrow, June 1st, is when the quantitative tightening will start. So why do you think the Federal Reserve uh, will, won't be able to do that? Why do you say that? Well, remember, there's $31 trillion of debt in the United States. So 1% up in interest rates is about $310 billion of extra interest. And so you're talking about the defense budget of the United States is $700 billion, 680. So 1%, if you think of interest and entitlements on the debt, before COVID was about 60% of interest and entitlements. So interest payments and entitlements were the budget, the U.S. budget. And after COVID, you're near 70%. So this whole thing that the Fed's doing is a complete charade. The Fed has their pawns, you know, your Nick Tamaranos of the Wall Street Journal, your Jan Hatzius. I mean, these are pawns of the Fed and they are used just like pawns. So the Fed wants to, to tighten financial conditions without actually doing anything. So far, they've, they haven't done any quantitative tightening. They haven't, they've only hiked basis points, essentially uh, 75 basis points, which is three rate hikes. And so they've done a good job of using their pawns to scare everybody. But in terms of what they can actually do, there's an extra 10, there's an extra 15, 20 trillion of debt on the planet today that there wasn't the last hiking cycle. So this is a big charade. It's a game. It's, it's, a, it's a sham. And the Fed just can't do everything they say they want to do. So you want to be long hard assets here because at the end of the day, the Fed has a choice. They can blow up if they go forth with 75, you know, 50. The street was trying to sell. I mean, the, pawn, the, the Fed pawns were trying to sell us three weeks ago on 75 basis points, 50, 50, and then endless 25 basis points with, like you said, one trillion of quantitative tightening. It's complete BS. They can't do it. If they do it, they'll blow up the global economy. They'll blow up the U.S. economy. will be in a depression. And so, therefore, when they pause, what – names are going to do the best. Hard assets, gold miners, silver miners, Hecla mining, GDX, Barrick Gold. Those are the names that through the last decade, whenever the Fed overpromises and under delivers, those are the names that do the best, your hard asset plays. Overpromises on the, the tightening side. Larry, at what point, so the Federal Reserve, you say it's going to blow up the world, the Federal Reserve will break something. But what if the choice is to either break something or to keep inflation in check? Uh, you know, that certainly is a, a incentive for the Federal Reserve, right? If, if inflation is still at 
it doesn't matter if, you know, HYG is at 68, like they're going forward, right? Or well, no? remember inflation expectations have come way down. So, um, so if you look at break evens, if you look at five year break evens, 10 year break evens, the Fed has brought them down. So inflation expectations have plummet- plummeted the last like five weeks as the Fed has tightened financial conditions. So I, I hear you in terms of, you know, the Fed has to fight inflation. My point is, if the Fed has a choice between four to five percent inflation for the next five years and breaking something and really I'm talking about really breaking something like a Lehman type crisis or, or a long term cap type, more like a long term capital type crisis, they're going to choose for you know, four to five percent inflation. So they're going to bring inflation down. The, the problem is there's so much money in financial assets. Because think of all the investors watching us right now have lived through 10 years of Brexit, trade wars, COVIDs, COVID variants, Delta variants, Omicron, South Africa variants. So you've had all these things that have been driving people into what we call financial assets of bonds, tech stocks and growth. And so the entire planet's wealth is in the same investments for the last decade because we've been in like a really powerful deflationary decade where inflation always normalized back to 2%. This time, inflation normalizes at 4 or 5 Your entire asset allocation has to change to value stocks, to uh, emerging markets, countries like Brazil, EEM, emerging markets, and, uh, and hard assets instead of bonds, tech stocks, growth stocks. You say that the Federal Reserve hiking will cause the Federal Reserve to break something. You compare it to a a Lehman moment, a long-term capital management, a failure of a huge head fund in the late 90s. Uh, So tell us exactly what you think that would look like. Uh, Is it just the fact that the snowflakes of the world, so much wealth has been annihilated that uh, the economy shrinks? Is it it stress in the credit markets? Because, you know, I know you, you wrote about the Lehman moment um, in, in a book, uh, Colossal Failure of Human Sense. And I, I'm i curious if you think that it will be credit stress or it just will be sort of the, the tech stocks uh, falling so much in value. And thanks for that. Yeah, our, our book's now in 12 languages. It's a New York Times bestseller. So we've spent a lot of time on this. And at the end of the day, when Lehman fell, stocks lost seven trillion bucks. But bonds got you back three trillion. Stocks lost seven, bonds made you back three. This time, it's worse. Stocks have lost, you know, say close to five trillion bucks between, you know, between depending on what part of the market you're looking at globally. But bonds have lost about the same, about two to three. So you're, you're getting no offset from bonds and crypto lost you another trillion. And if you look at private equity, if you look at, venture capital, if you look at unicorns globally, I mean, these unicorns were valued at $4 trillion. And and the public unicorns are down 70, 80, 90%. So that means that you've lost another 2 trillion in unicorn. We think think the Fed has already wiped out 20 to $25 trillion. They've wiped it out, okay? So in crypto and private equity and unicorns and NASDAQ stocks and ARK stocks and bonds, Treasuries, and so the Fed can't. I mean, this is like, this is preposterous that you th- anybody that thinks that the Fed can keep marching on with 50, 50, 50 after they've wiped out twenty five trillion dollars is smoking something. Like it's just not happening. And and so they're gonna just what they'll do is they'll they'll they'll, they'll kind of play these games where they you know play the hawkish game back away, which they've already done last week. You've got Bullard. And Bostic come out and talk about potentially a pause for next year. You know, this is the same crowd that was pitching us and their their pawns. They were pitching us 50, 50, 75 endless rate hikes. And now the the Fed's leaking or going out in the public uh, speaking tour and talking about a pause. So clearly they're softening, right? It's it's a fact relative to where they were promising three weeks ago. How how high do you think the Federal Reserve can get, let's say, on a a Fed funds rate. I know at a time the terminal rate was something like 3.25. I figure it's probably a little bit lower based on the the backing off that the Fed has done recently. 
how far do you think the Fed can get? And I might ask a question about QT. How, how, by how much do you think the Federal Reserve will be able to reduce its balance sheet before it has to go back into dovish mode? Well, we know in 2018 that in the third quarter to the fourth quarter, they went to $50 billion a month. And they can only stay there for three months. So we know that happened, right? So in terms of quantitative tightening. So they, they, they started off at, I think, 15 to 20 in September, going into the fourth quarter of 2018, they went to 50 billion a month. And by, by the fall, I'm sorry, by December, we were down 20, 25% of the S&P asset prices were crashing and they backed away. Um, so now they're, they're supposed to do a trillion dollars of QT. They can only do 600 billion last cycle. So I, I just don't see, I think there's so much more debt in the world that when they push up, when they push up rates and they do quantitative tightening now, because there's so much more debt, people, people don't understand. Like after Lehman failed, I wrote about this in my book, we did a little bit under 2 trillion of fiscal and monetary a combination. After COVID and over the last couple of years, even with the, the Biden team did an infrastructure bill and the whole thing comes out to 10 trillion of fiscal and monetary. So you can't go from like that kind of spent. Think of the fiscal cliff that we're living through right now. Think of like, look at the Walmart numbers, look at Target numbers, look at big lots, look at, I mean, just look at Brinker International, EAT equity, look at Chipotle, look at Starbucks. These things, these stocks are all down 40, 50, 60%. The largest restaurant chains in America are down 60%. So that's because the, you're, you're doing, uh, you're not only hype, not only promising endless rate hikes and uh, quantitative tightening, but we're also reducing your our fiscal posture by close to a trillion bucks. People forget about this. Like, why, why isn't this even in discussion? We, we're literally cutting back on fiscal spending by a tr almost a trillion dollar fiscal drag and trying to do uh, this much, uh, you know, quantitative tightening. It's just, it's preposterous. These guys are literally, they're, they're academics that have never taken risk, okay? These people, you couldn't put them on a, they could never sit at Goldman Sachs in a risk-taking seat and make a penny annually for a living. These are these are academics. They're just guessing in the wind. They're holding up their finger with the, within the air and they're maybe, okay, we think we can do that. And then they have their pawns that go out and try to sell us on X, Y, and Z plans. The whole thing is BS. It's like, it's literally bullshit. I mean, it, it's complete, utter, you know, finger in the air. We think we can do this. It doesn't mean that they actually can do it. A lot of interesting points. I uh, will play devil's advocate on one of them, which is, uh, I'm not even pushing back. It's, it's just that I think there's a lot of BS in the markets themselves in terms of, oh my God, I have a juice company uh, clearly I must be worth $5 billion. Uh, and then the analysts are saying, actually, it's worth $10 billion. And then retail it goes to $15 billion and retail plows in. And there's just so much fictitious wealth, Larry, in the private markets, in the public markets. Like, you know, I think there are a lot of engineers, let's just say engineers who quit being an engineer to trade crypto full time. Like that is a sign that there's too much, the wealth effect is turned too much, that there's something perverse in the system. And you know, you say that the Federal Reserve is going to destroy all this wealth. What if that's necessary? And what if the the abundance of false wealth that we have in society is the reason that we have inflation at eight and a half percent? And you have to restore it. I completely agree. It's necessary. The question is, do you do it? Do you, do you wipe out 30 trillion in like three months and keep going? Like you probably want to wipe out 30 trillion over two, three years. Uh, you don't want to have stocks and bonds and crypto all going down together at the same time. I mean, this whole crypto, this whole DeFi thing is, is like you said, it's, it, it's baloney too. I mean, it's not, there's, not, there's no preservation of capital. We've had the, the worst inflationary period in the last 20 years. And inf crypto is essentially just a play on the VIX. So if equity volatility is high, Bitcoin gets destroyed. It, it's, it's not offering anybody any kind of store value. And so, yeah, I do think this... I do think you're absolutely right. The problem is the Fed was accommodated for so long, they created probably 20 Bernie Madoffs that are out there in the countryside sipping mint juleps as we speak, and they have to be eliminated. 
And you're absolutely right. I completely agree with that. I'm just saying like when you when you sit back and you do nothing for you know, two years while Archegos is going down, while all these different crypto coins that I mean, there's literally 400 different coins made by some credible people, but 80 percent of them are probably made by hucksters and, and Bernie Madoff types that are just trying to you know get rich. And so uh, they, they sat back, and while Bill Wang and all these and all these ARK stocks, you know, went up seven, eight hundred percent, and now now they've basically unwound some of that. But the question is, they waited too long, and now they're trying to catch up too fast. And in the meantime, they risk blowing up the system. What's your base case for? how high the Federal Reserve can get before something breaks. I know we've got we've got two fifties in front of us, uh, which will then will be at 175. Do you think the Federal Reserve gets to there and do you think it gets beyond there or do you think the Fed will be stuck at, at 175 for the Fed funds rate? Well they'll they'll take it over the next two months to two and a half in the next like three months and then they'll stop. And so that's where they had to stop last time and there was at least 10 trillion less debt on the planet last cycle. So if you think of like 2018, they stopped at two and a half. And now we have a lot more debt on the planet. We have a lot more debt on the corporate side, consumer side. So the ability of the Fed to push the, the terminal rate to three and a half, four or five, it's all complete BS. You know, these, these Fed governors get up there and say that it's just there's just too much debt. And when you push up, like literally 25 basis point rate hike today is equivalent to 1% 20 years ago. It's just too much debt. Yeah. I always think about the, the that argument makes sense to me conceptually, but you only, the government only has to pay it when it refinances the debt, right? So they have enough, they have the, t- t- the Treasury General account, they have enough for like a year. I mean, it's long term, I agree it's unsustainable, but the, it, it is possible, right? You think the Fed? It's not the Fed won't do it, but you, it is possible for the Federal Reserve to raise it. Well, we we already saw what, when they when they moved we, what the, when seventy five basis points plus all the threats, they blew up. They basically blew up the crypto market. They've they've got many parts of the commercial real estate market in flames. High yield leverage loans all blowing out over the last like three four weeks uh, to the point where high yield issuance stopped. Right, and and mortgage rates. You're talking about home builders down 40, 50 percent. You know, Starbucks down 40 percent, restaurants down 40 percent. I mean, I, I just don't. That's all with 75 basis points. So how, how far can they go? I mean, if they go another three, you know, two and a half, three percent from here, the financial conditions are going to stop them. And what do you make about the longer end of the yield curve, let's say the 10-year or the 30-year? We've had a huge sell-off in those types of notes and bonds as well. Do you think we get much higher than than 3 3.5% there or or no? Same well, as short we're, prob- we're going to have a rally here toward the middle to the end of the year because we have, if you look at the refunding schedule, there's not a lot of issuance in the July-August period. Toward the end of the year, issuance picks up again. So the last like three, four years, we've had this rally in the middle of the year. Last year, it was, if you remember, Alphadine blew up. It's a billion dollar hedge fund. And so we probably have a rally in the middle of the year uh, as, the, as the U.S. economy slows down. But then, you know, tens over the next two, three years are going to have a much higher plane because the Europeans are issuing more debt. The U.S. is issuing more debt. And so we're going to normalize it three and a half to f- close to maybe four and a half percent on tens and thirties. But that's like over the next two, three years, it's much higher regime change for interest rates. And, and, and that, that's, that's another problem that we have to deal with. And that's what might force the Fed eventually into some type of, uh, some type of more sustainable MMT. Because if rates go up too much, then there's a mathematical a leverage problem with that. Do you think that a good analog for what we're going through is the dot-com bust and the bear market from 2000 to, to 2003? Because you're seeing a lot of 
companies that have gone public that perhaps, and this is just my opinion, you know, they didn't really have a reason to go public. Like they, 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 they they're pre-profit, they're pre-revenue, they're, they're they're really just an idea, not not a business. And you've seen tremendous losses in that. And the, you know, the SPAC machine keeps on churning. Do you think that that resembles the the dot com uh, bust, which I, I know you know you sort of witnessed as you were beginning your career? Yes, we were fortunate. We sold ConvertBond.com to Morgan Stanley. October of 99 it was the best trade of my life. <laughs> you know, we were, if we if we literally had tried to sell the website to Morgan Stanley a year later, we've got nothing for it. So, uh, you know, I lived through that. There's no question. It's the same thing. It's the same thing all over again. It's 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 e toys. It's look at the convertible bond universe, right? So, if you look at the amount of converts that are in this space, whether it be MSTR, MicroStrategy. Uh, Snap. I mean, you got multiple, you know, 50 plus convertible issuers. Now, remember, the convertible bond market is the classic last saloon on Wall Street. It's the place where you go. It's a very, it's a very questionable part of, of the capital markets, right? Because companies go to the convertible convertible bond market to finance things and assets that are, that it's kind of the last saloon, the last place you can go, right? And so we're the very tertiary type companies and tertiary types of transactions occur. And so when you see an explosion in the convertible bond market, the way you saw in 99, the way you saw in 2000, uh, 2021, it's the same thing all over again. At the end of the day, it's going to push money toward value stocks. It's going to push money toward global value. So your EWU, your companies that are globally positioned in hard assets, your Glencores, your BPs, your valets, your Rios. These are companies that actually control massive amount of hard assets. And what we saw in the post.com period, that 2001, two, three, four, is a transition out of the United States and into global value stocks. And if you, know, and if you look on a multiple basis, these stocks globally are, are still dramatically cheaper than U.S. equities. So everybody was crowded in U.S. equities the last five years, you know, searching for that growth train that was that was funded by the Fed. And now with the Fed, you know, back on their heels, you're going to see just a colossal rotation into EWU type portfolios, your global value names. If I, we apply your prediction that the Federal Reserve will pivot to the dot com bubble, you actually you're actually completely right. I think the Federal Reserve stopped hiking and started to cut shortly after the bubble burst, but it did not save the pets.com. It did not save the Akamai Technologies. It didn't even save the legitimate companies like Cisco or, or Microsoft. Do you think that that's going to happen where the Federal Reserve will pivot, but the snowflakes, it's just because the Federal Reserve pivots doesn't mean that Snowflake is, is getting a bid, or do you think it does? Yeah, the, these names, a typical bear market where there's that much wealth destruction you get these beautiful counter trend rallies that eventually end up in a washed out base that take three, four, five years to kind of normalize and come out. And that's why I look, look at, if you look at the SWN or energy transfer charts, you're talking about um, companies that came out of an incredible bull market in, say, the 2000, 19, 2008 to 2012 period. Uh, he's talking about stocks that dropped 60, 70, 80 percent, stayed there for three years, four years, and are now coming out. That's a healthy, that's a healthy new bull market. Whereas stocks, tech stocks that crash, counter trend rally 30 percent in two weeks, crash, that, that type of thing eventually washes out the hot money. And eventually you have a, a, a bottoming formation that lasts a good 24 months minimum, and then you come out. And yeah, yeah we're, we're each, you have a, a, a counter trend rally, but each high is lower than the previous high. So it's just, it gives hope, but it does not satisfy those hopes. If Larry, if so much of the S&P 500 is com- our companies like Tesla, like Netflix, that would fit in that long duration, you know, semi-profitable technology cop, uh, uh, companies, what does that mean for the S and P five hundred? I mean, do you think that let's say the, the 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 trend line over the past ten years will is is going to be broken? The S and P is going to basically we won't hit that November high and take it out 
probably for three to five years. The same thing that happened between 2000 to 2007. It took like five years to take out that 2000 high. It's the same problem. Like you said, so much of the S&P's market cap is in growth and so little was in materials and energy. And that's all tra- literally as we speak behind me right now, this is all transitioning. Tech resources, that's been one of our core holdings in our portfolio. That company is where money is flowing. Uh, Stan Druckenmiller now owns a piece. Einhorn's owned a piece through Greenlight Capital for over a year and a half. But you're seeing really some of the best money managers in the world move into these resource companies that that actually produce coal, met coal, steel, copper. The U.S. grid for electric vehicles in the United States is 50 years old. So you're, you're talking about even... I would say that probably the most exciting part of tech right now that that probably will have some big fiscal support over the next couple of years are your solar names, your uranium names, uh, your nuclear power, you know, the, your URNM, your Cameco's. You know, these are part of our core holdings because this is the new technology that's going to support uh, the, 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 gr- the green revolution that eventually will take take hold. So when you say now is a great time for risk assets, but then you also said that you think the S&P 500 won't take out its November 2021 highs for three to five years. It sounds like you think this is a tradable bounce, but it's not a start of a new bull market. Yes, it's a tradable bounce, but it's a start of a new bull market within sectors within the United States. So SWN, Southwestern Energy, energy transfer, these there's many parts of the S&P that have been through five, six, seven year bear markets. The FCG type equities that's uh, in, the oil, in the natural gas space. So the United States is now gonna have a, a more permanent natural gas price in the six to $9 range. Whereas in the previous cycle, we, we had, a, had a deflationary force with natural gas in the one to three range. And so there's, there's so much demand globally for natural gas now coming on the heels of the war. And, and so this transition in the United States toward natural gas global exports, LNG, this, this whole new transition is gonna support parts of, of the market that, that have already been through their 10 year bear markets. Today's episode is brought to you by Bit.com, a leading cryptocurrency trading platform. From spot to futures to options trading and more, Bit.com has it all. So whether you're a seasoned investor or you're new to the game, you need to be on Bit.com. Bit.com has launched a zero taker fee option campaign until May 10th. To enroll, email VIP at Bit.com. That's Bit spelled B-I-T. So email VIP at Bit.com and tell them I sent you. Okay, and I, I know, Larry, you were big into the, you're very bullish on commodity stocks, in particular energy. And you were quite bearish on, I don't know if you had any shorts on, but you, you and your community was very bearish on the long duration, unprofitable technology area. Both of those trades have worked out phenomenally well. Larry, where do you think we are now? You know, Do you think energy still has room to run? Do you think that the snowflakes of the world are, are still going to go down? What, they've gone from $350 to 150 Can they go to 50 I mean, where are we headed? On both well, legs in trade. some parts of energy, Jack, it, it's pretty crazy right now. I mean, if you watch CNBC or Bloomberg, you can literally watch seven guests in a row recommending energy stocks. And these are the same people that were literally h- hiding under the desk in uh, the first, second, third quarter of 2020. Uh, energy was the most hated sector. It was 2% of the S&P. Now it's going to be 5 6% of the S&P. So for right now... The sell signal we're getting on the XLE name, so your major producers, for the short term is very strong. I mean, we're, you're talking about a sector that's now 41% above its 200-day moving average. Very unusual. And so, uh, you know, all the kind of tourists have come in. It was an empty valley. Uh, there weren't anybody, any patrons on the field. And now you've got tourists that are just walking into energy, new investors that really don't know much about the space at all. So you've got to be very careful. But within energy, in the natural gas space, Southwestern Energy uh, is trading at two times EBITDA. So you still have some value 
in the natural gas, really what's called, I think it's a decimated space. You're talking about a sector that 10 years ago, these stocks were much higher. And so SWN equity energy transfer, that's where we're looking in energy. We're looking at kind of beaten down stocks, stocks within the sector, but within oil and gas, especially within gas, that are going to benefit from this new kind of regime change globally for U.S. natural gas. If you think of like when I was when I was your age coming up in the business, uh, the material sector was 11 percent of the S&P. And even easy, even as of January this year, materials were like three to four percent of the S&P. So metals by themselves are still massively underowned. Twenty trillion dollars was in the Nasdaq 100 on January 1st, 20 trillion. Now it's about 15, but it's still 15 trillion bucks. And there's not a lot of money in metals. So. I still think you're you, you're going to get a bo- like a, a bounce in some of these tech net names, especially like biotechs. I think the, the XBI we're getting a category five capitulation in in biotechnology XBI type equities. But for your Teslas, your Apples, uh, you you just have tremendous supply. And the thing about a bear market, what I mean by supply is if if you look at a chart of Apple. Uh, or Tesla, any kind of rally here, you're going to come up in a, in a massive supply of stocks. And and what I mean by that is in a bear market, in a bull market, you want to make money. In a bear market, you want your money back. And the, the, the problem is every investor, every wealthy American owns the same eight stocks. And they've been in these eight stocks for a long time. They've done well. But now when you get a counter trend rally in Apple or Tesla, and people are, are have been have lost you know 30 40 50 percent of their money in tech stocks then you get this bounce and people will sell into the bounce how are you getting a sense of the positioning when you, when you talk to the institutional clients because you know I look at something like the the Bank of America uh, fund survey and it says that everyone's super bared up that everyone is, is rushing to cash uh, but it, it seems to me like there are still quite a lot of institutional investors who are still piling in cash and, and still still are buying the dip. Uh, and I guess the significance, and correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, is that if everyone is super bared up, there's no one left to become bearish so that we could have a bottom. But if if there's still hope in the market, then there's there's a chance that uh, things could get even more bearish. So how are, you, how are you getting sense? Are people looking to put cash to work or are they in full panic mode? We're seeing some people, you know, pl- going to play this counter trend rally because like, like you said, the decimation in the NASDAQ relative to all the previous drawdowns has just been so spectacular. And especially within the NASDAQ, like within, there's like you said, the snowflakes of the world. Uh, the street had an, a target of snowflake in January of like $400. And now, you know, the stock's near 100. So so you're, you're talking about a lot of names that have been destroyed. And uh, within that destruction, the best example would be uh, the K Web names, China. I mean, think about China. You've got uh, you had the the China credit impulse implode last year. You had obviously these incredible lockdowns, draconian lockdowns they put forth this year. And then you had don't forget you had Delta variant, Omicron. You had uh, just you had a regulatory regime change in China that scared everybody out of these stocks. Right in the third, fourth quarter, even the first quarter, where your your, your government of China was kind of going after some of the K-Web names. And then on top of that, you know, you just had uh, this tremendous amount of angst around China equities after the Russia uh, invasion. And so for the first time in, in, my, in, my, in my career, in the last like two months, we have high net worth and in individuals, family offices coming into us saying, geez, if they can do that to, chi- to, to Russian equities, what can they do to China? In other words, people were actually equating a $17 trillion economy in China with a $1 trillion economy in Russia. In other words, so the, the world has excluded Russia from the global economy through sanctions. Uh, not, not 100%. Obviously, there's oil and gas that everybody needs. But for the most part, those stocks have been shunned and people were putting... Uh, K-Web names in the same basket. 
basket. Today, KWeb for the first time is above its 50-day moving average. It's breaking a, a vicious counter trend. I'm sorry, it's breaking a vicious downtrend. And so you're in the middle of a down a counter trend rally. And so we think the KWeb names can really start to outperform the NASDAQ here for the second half of the, of the year. Larry, tell me what you're seeing in the credit markets. Is there anything there that distresses you and you think would cause a, a Powell pivot? Well, there's, there's no question that there's, there's a financial crisis brewing in commercial real estate. We, you know, you've got properties like, like Hudson Yards were built at a different time, built for a different era. And the amount of square footage in New York relative to what New York needs relative to the actual sustainable population right about now, crime rates are higher. Just about everybody I know that I lived, my wife and I and the kids lived in New York for 15 years. I wouldn't take my family back there right now. No way. Uh, just crime's too high. Uh, COVID policies are too draconian. And so there's just this massive transfer of population in the United States into safer places. Uh, obviously, everybody knows about what's happening with the commute and the amount of actual work time and office space. These are all secular changes that, that aren't going away. So, so in the credit markets, this is one of the things we talked about you know, eight weeks ago. You saw real weakness in high yield, real weakness in commercial real estate, but equities were make, make, making a really an incredible bounce there maybe seven, six, seven weeks ago. And so right now, over the last 10 days, high yield has stabilized. That's a good thing. But for the most part, there's definitely a brewing crisis. And look at, look at Vernardo equity. Looks very sick. VNO equity. Look at the banks that are most exposed to New York. Uh, signature and New York Community Bank relatives of the other banks in the XLF and the KRE. They look very sick. So there's something going on under the surface where the amount of, of actual tenants that are sustainable to support commercial real estate projects, to com- support commercial real estate, secured financing and securitizations, that is in trouble. Lyra, I know that You've been you've been thinking about shorting the dollar. The, the U.S. dollar has exploded higher against the the euro and the yen. As I think part of it is interest rates differentials that the Federal Reserve is much more hawkish than the Bank of Japan and and the European Central Bank. So as a result, uh, capital flows into the United States. I know it's a lot more complicated than that, but why are you why why are you sort of why do you want to fight the trend and short the U.S. dollar when the dollar is you know making multi year highs? Well, when you come out of a period where the last six months, nine months, think of the dollar tailwinds. These are incredible. You had the Delta variant. You had Evergrande, which is a massive commercial real estate crisis in China. You had Omicron, the China lockdowns, this COVID revival that's come back and at the global economy five six different times over the last year and a half. And then you have the China credit impulse imploding down all of last year. The China, the amount of the amount of monetary and fiscal support that was coming out to the global economy from China, the China credit impulse, that, that really imploded all of last year. And then you had the Bank of the Fed promising endless hikes. You had the Bank of Japan promising endless accommodation. You had the ECB sitting on their heels. Meanwhile, inflation was raging there. So you had like seven, eight different forces all supporting the dollar at the same time. Now we look at the party Congress in China in the fall. China's done a lot to deleverage. China's done a lot to uh, really show the world that they can put forth a COVID policy uh, on a grand scale, which I think that was their goal. China's gone a long way to punish some of the bad guys, the Jack Ma's of the world, you know, what they call bad guys. So China's basically done all the, you're going to have a period where the world normalizes from COVID over the summer, summer travel picks up, China uh, re-stimulates heading toward the party Congress and really opens up. And that type of an environment is extremely bearish for the dollar because where the dollar does well is that flight to quality into that flight to safety. And so we've had nine months of a perfect storm of flight to safety, 
in flight to quality. And there's 64 trillion of GDP outside the United States, 20 trillion in. If that 64 trillion of GDP outside the U.S. stabilizes, and it's been under tremendous pressure because of China and because of Europe and because of COVID, um, that's going to really drive dollars. And not to mention the fact a 2001, 2003 dynamic where investors globally that are in the United States have been hammered, have been whacked. Investors in, in FANG stocks have been destroyed. So all of that money is going to start moving its way out of the United States, out to the rest of the world. And that sets up a really good dynamic for gold, silver, hard assets. And you want to you know, kind of be long those harder assets, those types of plays, your emerging markets, your EEM, your EWZ. These are the assets that do the best you know, when the dollar is kind of normalizing relative to the rest of the world. Right. EWZ is, is Brazil. Larry, how much of your thesis uh, depends upon the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan tightening significantly? Well, yeah, that, that's a big part of it. But And you're seeing that the last eight, nine, 10 days. The ECB is like just what they're the ECB policy rate was three uh, percent when you know a decade ago, a little bit more than a decade ago. And inflation was two standard deviations lower. So the ECB policy rate was 3% like 12 years ago when the inflation rate in Europe was two to three standard deviations lower. These guys are really, uh, these, are, these are economically, they, this, these, are, these are academics that have massively lost credibility. They have to get that credibility back. So the ECB is way behind the curve relative to the Fed. The ECB has a lot more catching up to do than the Fed. And so... The ECB has to normalize. We're going to have a nearshoring, reshoring renaissance where countries like Mexico and Brazil are going to be the backup to the east-west supply chains. So as we came out of World War II, Vietnam, we had this peace dividend. Everybody got too complacent in the world around this east-west supply chain with Vietnam, with Bangladesh, with China, with India. And, and I, I agree with Andre. This is all transferring north-south in the Americas. So you're going to have a, a massive reconstruction of supply chains, backup supply chains, nearshoring uh, across Brazil, across Mexico, across Panama, across Dominican Republic. These, the, the investments in this part of the world are, are, are just dramatically uh, attractive relative to other parts of the world because there really needs to be a massive reconstruction of the global supply chain uh, to, to more of a backup scenario that doesn't allow the United States to be in that really horrifically complacent position that we're in, in the, in the, as, as, as we witnessed in the, in the COVID period. Even with reshoring to Mexico and, and Brazil, how uh, significant do you think deglobalization is as an inflationary force? Because now things are being made uh, in, in a more expensive way. And also, to what degree is that outside of the remit of the Federal Reserve, where, you know, Fed funds rate could be 10 percent, but it doesn't matter if something is made in Mexico rather than Vietnam, uh, it's more expensive, right? You're absolutely correct. What's happening is the power of labor in the United States is much stronger. OK, so think of, think of Starbucks. They canceled a buyback plan, a multi a billion dollar buyback plan because of labor issues, supply chains, reshoring. All of this stuff, all of these changes are inflationary, more permanence. That's why inflation normalizes at 4 to 6% and stays there for five years. That's going to drive money into value stocks, commodities, and, and into global equities. And if you think of what, this is really a catastrophic uh, miscalculation by the Davos crowd, right? So what the Davos crowd, this is all part of my next book, they took 7 million jobs out of the United States the last 15, 20 years. They shotgun them into, into Bangladesh, into India, into Vietnam and China. Guess what? They did a good thing. They raised the standard of living dramatically in emerging markets. The bad thing is they decimated the Rust Belt because you've taken 7 million jobs and you've shotgunned them around the world. Meanwhile, taxes and education costs in the United States are still create crazy elevated levels. And so you have families that have been decimated in the United States, 
but a standard of living globally that's dramatically improved. But guess what? The problem with that, when you dramatically increase the standard of living in emerging markets in India and in Bangladesh, guess what? There's a billion people in India that don't have air conditioning. There's a billion people in China that don't have an automobile. So the Davos crowd was successful at really transforming the global economy and to really bringing hundreds of, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That's a good thing. The problem is the same crowd has been putting forth this ESG mantra for the last five years. And so if you look at the amount of investments in metals, oil, and gas that is necessary to supply all of these people coming out of poverty in Bangladesh, India, China, we are literally two to three trillion dollars behind the eight ball. In other words, if you look at if you look at where we were in 2014, Jack, right? That if, if you took the capital expenditures in 2014 in oil and gas and metals and you put them forward at the same pace they were on until today, we would have spent three trillion dollars. Guess what? ESG and the Larry Finks of the world and the disinvestment and, and all the incentives not to invest in, 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 in carbon and in oil and gas and metals, all of those disincentives basically took $3 trillion out of the path of investments. And here we are in a world where your average family in India, Bangladesh, these, these families are making more money. They're consuming more energy than they ever have before. They're, they're, they're basically taking, they're, they're, they're a much bigger part of the global energy consumption. And what's happened is we're, we're, we're literally, we're, we're, it's like an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. It takes miles and miles and miles to turn this thing around. We are literally going to be, it's going to take 10 to 15 years to get that t two to three to four trillion dollars of capital expenditures needed to find the oil and gas, needed to find the metals to support this electric vehicle revolution, to support these, these the demand for energy. The diesel fuel in India is exploding in demand. We've got no diesel. You know, this, this whole thing is a bunch of com very confused intellectuals that have, have screwed up the planet. And all, most of them are in Davos. Yeah, and a lot, e even if India's and China's demand for energy is going to be met 100% from green energy, that green energy, as you say, requires nickel, it requires copper, it requires graphite, scandium, vanadium, and... You, you can't you can't you can't cancel those mines and call that environmentalism because you need that yeah, to, but, to run. Electric. But these countries cannot afford the, the solar wind investments that that are required right now. They cannot. They will be able to afford them over 20, 30 years. But essentially, like carbon neutral twenty fifty. In reality, if you do the math, and this is what Elon Musk is saying, it's really 2080, 2090. And therefore, you're going to have to fill that void with nuclear power, you know, to fill that void with natural gas, fossil fuels. Or that's going to be the bridge to get you to the green meadow. But the, the Davos crowd has really messed up the planet in terms of we've done a great job at bringing hundreds of millions, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But we have a new growing demand from a very poor. Remember, there's 150 million people in India, Jack, without electricity. 150 million with, with no electricity at all. So th those people are now going to be consuming, you know, they're going from zero energy consumption to energy consumption. So, so we have a, a whole new world to get, to get used to and then great opportunities ahead. Refined products, that's where the crisis is right now. So refined products of diesel, jet fuel. So there's two types of crisis. The one crisis is the oil crisis. And you're right, you, you could see $140 oil. But worse than that, in the United States and in Europe, the refined product crisis, there's, there's just not a lot of refined diesel fuel, not a lot of refined jet fuel. So we're, we're coming into a summer driving season. A, a, I know at least four or five friends that have done no traveling for the last two summers that are going to travel this summer and they're going to fly to Europe or they're going to fly to you know longer distances. And so, yeah, that refined products crisis is going to rear its ugly head this summer. That's recessionary, both in the United States and Europe. 
So, so how high do you think the price of oil will go? And uh, do you think it will cause a recession or already has? Yeah, we, we, we're, we're already, excuse me, we're already in recession in the United States. I mean, we're, we have one negative quarter of GDP. We're very close. The Atlanta Fed's come down. I mean, the consumer at the Walmart target level is, is, is crushed. Now, the consumer at the Davos crowd level, these guys have a lot of cash. Like the people in, in New York and California, people on the coast, the echo chamber, they're sitting on a lot of cash. But the average, like Joe Lunchpail, uh, middle class to lower middle class family in the United States, decimated. And they're, we're clearly in a recession. So, yeah, we probably have one last blow off top in energy up near like 140, 150 this summer. And then it just puffs itself out. Wow. So you think I was asking about Europe, but you think in the U.S. we're already in recession. So you must think that therefore probably that Europe is in a recession, too, as well as China. So all three major financial centers of the world are in, are in recession. That's why that's why we're going to have to have a weaker dollar to get out of this. We're going to have to have China re-stimulate. We're going to have to have Europe re-stimulate. Uh, the, the, there's just... There's just too much economic destruction that's already taken place from inflation. And, you know, I, I, I just think the United States is like every all the investors in the world have been hiding out in the United States as the planet normalizes. As we come out of this global recession, uh, that's where the dollar weakens. That's one way to get out of this as a weaker dollar supports the global economy and that supports the European economy, China, investment, boom, that's how we get out of it. But but everything you just described is very well known. So that's why like you want to play like where where's the trade for the next 12 months? It's the coming out of this global recession. Larry, is there anything else that we, we haven't covered? We've covered a, a, a lot of topics. Um, what else is on your mind? Well, just, you know, our book is, is now in 12 languages, a colossal player of common sense. It's one of the best selling business books in the world. And it was just voted by the CFA Institute in the top 20 all time. And so we're really excited about our existing book, but our, but our new book really has to do with this major transition globally uh, from a dynamic where the United States is really, has to, has to has a major reconstruction of energy policies coming forth. And, and that's kind of like, where we want to think about for the next 10 years is your, you know, where are, where are the trades for the next 10 years? They're coming out of this, a move into hard assets, a move into a world where inflation is sustainable at four to 6% stays there. And so, you know, that, that's kind of where our head is, is around like the previous decade was a deflationary decade where inflation normalized at 2% and stayed there for a long time. And now we're, in this stagflationary period that, that hangs around a long time. Larry, thanks so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, hearing your views. Uh, viewers can find you on Twitter at uh, co uh, Convert Bond, and uh, they can check out your book, uh, check out Bear Traps Report. So uh, thanks so much, Larry. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it.